anyone who might be struggling with lymphoma. And to help us today, we have a very esteemed panel with us who I will introduce. We have Dr. Andrew Evans, Dr. Kara Kelly, and Dr. Eduardo Sotomayor. Thank you very much, doctors, for being with us today. I'd like to start for everyone out there to let you know that this is an open conversation. So if you have a question, we want you to participate. Uh, you can comment on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. That's Lymphoma Research Foundation on both of them. So please, if you have a question for these doctors, let us know and we will be happy to answer it here on the air. Before we get started, we do have a couple questions prepared, but I'd like the doctors to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their affiliations and the work that they're doing. Uh, so Dr. Evans, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. It's, my name is Andy Evans. I am professor of medicine, chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology and director of the Tufts Cancer Center in Boston. I'm a physician scientist, have a laboratory doing lymphoma research and also patient care and clinical research as well, in, all in lymphoma. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Kelly? Hi, thank, thanks very much. Um, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Kara Kelly. I'm chair of pediatrics at Roswell Park Cancer Institute and chief of the division of pediatric hematology oncology at the University of Buffalo. Um, I am primarily specialize in clinical trials, especially in Hodgkin lymphoma. And I've been involved with the Lymphoma Research Foundation as a member of its scientific advisory board, especially interested in the care of uh, adolescents and young adults with lymphoma, trying to have advances there. Excellent. And Dr. Sotomayor. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I am Eduardo Sotomayor. I am the director of the GW Cancer Center at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Like Andy, uh, I am a physician scientist. I have my lab working in uh, immunotherapy for lymphomas. So that has been my interest for, for 20 years. And also, I treat patients with lymphoma, and particularly a subtype of lymphoma uh, known as a mantle cell lymphoma. Excellent. And for those of you watching online, I do want you to know that this is going on live at the annual North American Educational Forum on Lymphoma. So you might hear some people coming from conferences throughout in the background, people going in and out of doors. This is a live event here. And they've been doing this event for more than 20 years. We'll have more information on the actual event throughout this program and at the end uh, so you can have more information for next year's event. But Dr. Evans, I want to start with you. What is lymphoma and how is it diagnosed? Sure. Lymphoma is, generally speaking, I would say, cancer of the immune system. Now when we say immune system, there are many different parts to our immune system. One of the more common parts are lymph nodes. We all have lymph nodes throughout the body, typically small. They're kind of the infection fighting centers and is, is one aspect. But there's immune cells ultimately everywhere in the body. They're in the blood. The blood is everywhere. So when a patient develops lymphoma, it can present in a few different forms. Sometimes it presents only with lymph node enlargement in various places in the body. Sometimes we see it more in the blood. All of our blood comes from the bone marrow inside the bones. So some patients will only have it in that place. And then others will have it in both places. But generally speaking, as it sounds, we think of it, and we've known this for many decades, it's really a whole body disease. We don't use surgery. We uncommonly use radiation. It's always been treatments that treat the whole body. In terms of diagnosis, Usually a patient will present with symptoms, and there are no real specific symptoms, but it can be fatigue, sometimes uh, uh, drenching night sweats where they have to change their clothes multiple times at night, high fevers, unexpected weight loss, and then hopefully they will present to their doctor. Often it's initially the primary care doctor who will have some suspicion and hopefully order some tests, maybe an x-ray or a CAT scan, and they might see a growth somewhere, uh, a lymph node growth, other times there might be anemia, et cetera. If it is a growth, they will sometimes send it to a surgeon, a biopsy will be done, and that's where we really work with our pathologist. You know, we're more oncologists, the, the treating end of the spectrum, but I can say we work very closely with the pathologist because there are many different kinds of lymphoma. Even though they're all very treatable, there's over 80 different kinds. And so who helps us determine that is the pathologist after the biopsy, and then we make the diagnosis, and ultimately they make their way to the lymphoma specialist or the oncologist. So with that being said, Dr. Sonomayor, I want to turn to you. Um, are there different treatment trajectories for each type of lymphoma? Yes, I mean, there are different uh, treatments. And what we discussed yesterday is for many years we have used what we call conventional treatment, that is either radiation, chemotherapy, or the combination of chemotherapy and radiation. 
And also for many years we have used, uh, for some patients, uh, what we call a, a bone marrow transplant. There are two flavors, Autolo using the patient's own bone marrow cells, and Allogeneic using a, a donor. So those are the treatments that have been, we have been used for many years. Uh, more recently, so because of the advances in understanding what is wrong with the lymphoma cells, so we start to look inside the lymphoma cells. And now we know uh, molecules of protein that are important for the survival of those. So after s investigators identify those what we call targets, then drugs have been developed. And, and so now we are entering the era of targeted therapy, and there are different therapies for different subtypes of lymphoma. So there are target therapy that we use for uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. There are target therapy that we use for uh, 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 follicular lymphoma, for mantle cell lymphoma. But also, you know, I should, I should highlight that some of these therapies can be used across the board, different type of uh, lymphomas. Uh, so more recently, we have making significant advances also in the treatment of, of T-cell lymphomas. So that would be the, the standard of care that we're talking about, correct? So, so the standard of care, it depends on the type of lymphomas. So there is not a standard of care for one lymphoma. So I, there is a standard of care for a, a, the most common B-cell lymphoma. There is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There is a standard of care that is using a combination of different drugs, CHOP plus rituximab. So that's the standard of care for that subtype of lymphoma. There is another subtype of lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, the one that I study for many years in which even in 2017, we don't have a standard of care yet. So, Dr. Kelly, I'd like to bring you in here. So what is the difference between standard of care and clinical trials then? So clinical trials are really the, the mechanism in which we obtain information to change the standard of care. You know, we have um, drugs that that are effective, but they either are not curing everyone or they're associated with a lot of uh, side effects, either in the short term or the long term. So clinical trials are, are really structured ways for us to look at how patients are responding, what the side effect profile is, and use that information to hopefully move forward with, with new ways of treating, you know, with goals of increasing the cure as well as reducing the side effects of the treatment. And who sponsors these clinical trials? Uh, the clinical trials are sponsored by a number of different uh, organizations. So some are developed by investigators, primarily at academic medical centers. Um, and they design the protocol, they oversee it, and, and oftentimes they will apply for research grants to support it. The second major um, sponsor are the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and they partner with investigators at academic medical centers and in the community uh, to develop and oversee these clinical trials that will, you know, again, collect information that will lead to licensing of the drug. And then the third is through um, cooperative research networks that are sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, these are very large networks in both pediatric and adult oncology where institutions come together, you know, typically hundreds of institutions and offer these clinical trials which is really important, especially since, as you heard from Dr. Evans, we have many, over 80 different types of, ly of lymphomas, and each one is relatively rare. Um, so it's important that we work collaboratively in order to perform these clinical trials and move the best treatments into the bedside. For the patient at home, what might be important to know about entering one of these clinical trials? Right. I think that oftentimes there's a misnomer about clinical trials, that people feel like we're experimenting or that they're, you know, guinea pigs, and that is by no means, you know, the case. These clinical trials are very carefully regulated. There's outside experts that are independent of the trial who carefully monitor to make sure that what's being offered is safe and has the patient's best interest. There also are different types of trials, um, some that are typically done in patients with relapse disease, which are really the earliest trials that give us information about the safety, to the phase three trial, the gold standard, which is where, um, you know, we have good information about the safety of the drug, and that's where we're comparing it to the standard treatment. So I would encourage patients to think about clinical trials. It allows the earliest access to many of these very exciting new drugs. And it also is done in a very carefully monitored way to really minimize the risk to the individual patient. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Evans, to these patients who may have been newly diagnosed with lymphoma, um, how common is it? Lymphoma? Yes. Yeah. It, when you look at it on the list of, let's say, top 10 cancers in the United States, it really, for men and women, comes out as only the seventh most common. 
there will be about, in this year, 2017, about a little north of 70,000 cases diagnosed across men and women. So maybe not the most common, although it is in the top 10, but I think what makes it maybe a little challenging, but I think it's a good thing, are all these different subtypes are within that 70,000 or so. So you might get down to a certain subtype of lymphoma where there's only a couple hundred diagnosed each year in the United States. So that's where, and that's, I would say, where clinical trials are helpful because you need collaboration. And sometimes, certainly collaboration across multiple sites in the United States, but it really has become a worldwide effort. And not that we always can do international clinical trials, but we're starting to do more of those where there are lymphoma experts and researchers in Germany, Italy, Switzerland, all over the world. And we're trying to do more of those collaboration efforts together because we all have the same goal. We want 100% cure rate and no side effects. And until we have that, we're going to keep studying it, keep doing clinical trials, et cetera. What are the challenges that exist in collaboration uh, throughout the world, and what's allowed it to happen more recently? Sure. I, I would say the, what's helped it more recently is probably just things like the Internet, things like <laughs> Facebook Live, things like LRF, just this you know, mass media uh, exchange where before you'd have to write a letter. Now we can easily communicate with everyone. So that's, that's maybe the obvious. The challenge is just coordination. And sometimes, even though we're familiar with the disease and maybe even familiar with the treatment, there's always a little bit of an unknown factor in clinical trials. So in part because of that, you need a lot of layers of regulation, of protection, of safety, and you need to really be able to share that information quite readily. I would say that's one barrier. The second barrier, uh, probably the barrier, not just international, all clinical trials, is funding, is, is re money. Unfortunately, to conduct clinical trials, it, it, it takes some funding. And we do work, as was alluded to, with pharmaceutical companies. The government, the funding's not quite as robust. Thankfully, organizations such as LRF are helping fund clinical trials. Because I tell you, there's not an absence of ideas. There's now, thankfully, not an absence of drugs. In fact, the opposite. There are hundreds and hundreds of these targeted drugs that Dr. Sotomayor talked about, very, very novel. So now we hope that's a whole other effort kind of working together on the funding aspect. Excellent. I just want to reset for those of you who may be joining us now on Facebook Live or YouTube Live. This is the 2017 Ed Chat for the Lymphoma Research Foundation. We are live here in downtown Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Bridge Marriott. And we have an esteemed panel of doctors here who are ready to answer your questions about lymphoma. So please feel free to comment if you have any, and we'll get those questions asked here. Um, Dr. Sotomayor, I'd like to switch topics just a little bit here. Um, what does the term active surveillance mean, and are there specific subtypes of lymphoma um, where that surveillance is used? Right. So, so active surveillance means that uh, after we, the patient is fi you know, finished with treatment, uh, so we need to follow those patients uh, to make sure that uh, the disease is not coming back. Uh, there are some type of lymphomas in which, uh, so like large cell lymphoma, that is the most common uh, subtype of B cell lymphomas, in which after a certain period of time, so if the disease is not coming back, so we can say, uh, I mean, we never say 100%, but probably we say 99.999% that the disease might not come back, and we say, well, the patient is cured. Uh, but there are other type of lymphomas in which, in spite of our treatments, so we know that at some point the disease is going to come back. That, that's what we call relapse. Uh, for those patients, uh, I would say in the past, uh, so we, we, we use a significant number of tests, including uh, CAT scans or PET scans. I mean, uh, that was probably 10 years ago. And now we realize that we don't need to do those type of tests because there is some exposure to radiation that we are trying to avoid. Plus, you know, now we know that even with using those CAT scans, you know, early detection might not change how the outcome of, of the disease. So, so, so these days, depending on the subtype of lymphomas, we re require the patient to you know, see us initially with frequency in our clinics. Could be every three months, every four months, but as the years pass by and there is no evidence that the disease is coming back, so we will uh, start to space out those visits to six months or even, even one year. And for some diseases, as I said, after some period of time, we said, okay, you are cured, now you are going to you become a long-term survivor. Okay. Right. Excellent. Thank you. We have our first question from YouTube. Uh, Mike is asking us, given that T cells are the cells that get cloned and become cancerous, 
what progress is being made to find a way for CAR T therapy to be viable? And I'll open that up to the floor. So that's a very interesting <laughs> question. And yes, so what, what we do with the CAR T cells, so basically the process is to take the patient's T lymphocytes and then uh, uh, take those T cells into the lab and then make those cells to divide more and then th those cells are going to be uh, infected with some modified viruses uh, that are going to incorporate DNA into those T cells and then so those T cells are going to be trained. It's like a, the T cells going to a, a, a training camp. So they are going to be modified and then after that they are going to graduate it and they are going to be given back to the patient and uh, so they are going to fight, they are going to identify and fight uh, cancer, right? So it's easy when the enemy is a B cell or is a solid tumor, so the T cells will go and kill them. Uh, so the problem with the T cell lymphomas that, uh, uh, that, that it was mentioned is that our army of soldiers also express the target that they're supposed to be attacking to. So then it's sort of basically what we are creating is an uh, army of T cells that can com commit suicide. But so Public now, right? So <laughs> so now so now what we are going to do, or we are trying to do, is because you can modify these days the technology exists to modify the T cells the way that you want. So you can make the T cells to express this type of protein, or you can make the T cells not to express that type of protein. So the idea is to combine the technology in which you produce the CAR T cells, but then you are going to make this T cell, the CAR T cell, immune to its own attack. So therefore, they can focus in attacking the malignant. T cell lymphomas, but that's I think is uh, there uh, is ongoing in the lab. But uh, so once that uh, T cells are created, then they're going to be tested in clinical trials. Yeah. And, and how is this done? Is this done within the patient? Is this done in a lab? It's is done it in the lab. So it's done in the lab. So we need so the CAR T cell. We need to collect uh, uh, blood from the patient, and then we isolate uh, what we call uh, mononuclear cells. Uh, and then we know how to activate these T lymphocytes, and then we do an additional manipulation put the receptor in, within the T cells, and then expand them, and then we're going to be injecting around two to three million T cells per kilogram back to the patient. It's one treatment, and the responses so far in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and patients with aggressive lymphomas uh, has been uh, quite promising around overall response rate around 50 to 60 percent, complete response rate 30, 40 percent. And these are patients that have failed all previous treatment. And because of that efficacy, the FDA recently approved two platforms, one for pediatric uh, acute lymphoblastic le leukemia patients, and three days ago it was approved a different platform of CAR T cell for patients with aggressive B cell lymphomas. So at this point now, does it go to a clinical trial or is this can be open to the public? So I think that what is, it's important for the audience to know that the treatments of today were the clinical trials of yesterday. So we are using these CAR T cells were approved because uh, patients were enrolled in clinical trials. So, so right now, these have been approved, so they can be used for treatment of patients with uh, relapsed uh, B cell malignancies. Uh, but it has to be done in a highly uh, trained environment because there are a lot of side effects. It's a treatment that is very efficient, but the problem when you activate the immune system is that, uh, I mean, at least in 2017, we don't have the capability to tell that these cells only attack the tumor cells. They are going also to produce a lot of factors, uh, toxins that are going to make the patients, some patients, not all, very sick. And that's the reason mm -hmm. why. So now that is FDA approved, so this treatment is going to be just given in highly selected, highly trained uh, academic centers. Dr. Evans? I agree, but it, uh, just in terms of the <coughs> clinical trial aspect, is they need clinical trials to get approved, but even yeah. once they're approved mm -hmm. and commercially available, yeah. the clinical trials continue because you know, even though we're excited with a new approval, it's not perfect. Yeah. And so it gets approved, yeah. usually by itself as a single agent, but then we start to ask, well, okay, great, it's approved, how can we make it better? and or less toxic. So sometimes we'll start to talk about combination therapies, mm -hmm. and those clinical trials, even though one of, or a couple of them are approved now by themselves, we're now starting a bunch of clinical trials. How can we combine other agents with it? Mm -hmm. So it really is a continuum of, yes, great, it's approved, let's keep making it better. So then, Dr. Kelly, when is it um, important for patients to ask their healthcare professionals about whether or not they should be participating in these trials? 
I, I think patients should always ask their healthcare provider about clinical trials. You know, there are many, many examples where, you know, that provides, you know, potentially a better option than the standard of treatment. So it's good to be educated right from the beginning as to whether there are any trials available for one's disease. I think, unfortunately, many times uh, they're not made aware that there are these options. Mm -hmm. So, you know, patients can ask their oncologist. Uh, they can, you know, go to uh, the National Cancer Institute's websites. Uh, there's a website, clinicaltrials.gov, that lists all of the trials. There's a, you know, a regulation that all trials have to be listed. Or they can contact um, organizations like uh, Lymphoma Research Foundation that has a helpline that helps patients to find a clinical trial that's appropriate for their disease. But I definitely recommend you know, people asking because this is the way to really access some of the most state-of-the-art uh, agents out there. Excellent. And with that being said, we have another question from YouTube. Amanda asks, are there clinical trials available for refractory PTCL? And the quick answer is yes. Okay. There definitely are. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the quick answer is yes. yes. There, it's a less common uh, of, at least in the United States, only about 15% of all of those lymphomas we talked about are T cell. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe a, a little harder, so to speak, and there's less commonality there, but there definitely are clinical trials. And, that, and that's what's fascinating, maybe not so much about CAR T cells, but some of these other drugs. Mm -hmm where they're almost, what I would say, tumor agnostic. In other words, one example is this class of drugs called PD-1 inhibitors. Mm -hmm. How does a PD-1 inhibitor? Generally speaking, it, you know, patient takes it, and it activates their own immune system, their T cells mm -hmm. and others. And that works in melanoma, which is a solid tumor that President Jimmy Carter had uh, that, that Dr. Sotomayor showed in his talk. And it also works in Hodgkin's lymphoma, and now we're exploring it in T cell lymphoma mm -hmm. and other B cell lymphomas. So it's fascinating how some of these drugs, even though they're targeted in a way, will have favorable effects in multiple different types. Excellent. Um, switching topics a, a little bit here, Dr. Sotomayor, um, what does frontline mean? Uh, and are there frontline therapies that are most commonly used for the treatment of lymphoma? So frontline means, uh, so after the patient receives the diagnosis of lymphoma, so we, so let's talk about the most common, again, diffuse larvae cell lymphoma. So it's diagnosed, and then it needs to be treated, and then we say, okay, you are, we are going to treat you. So the first treatment that the patient is receiving is what we call frontline therapy. In the case of diffuse larvae cell lymphoma, it's going to be the combination of CHOP, uh, rituximab, uh, and then the patient will receive cycles of treatment, and then uh, at the end of the treatment, we are going to do all the tests that we did at the beginning to make sure that there is no evidence of disease. Yeah. So that's frontline therapy, and then the patient is going to enter into active surveillance, and then if the disease comes back, then it's a relapse, and then we're going to, to talk about a treatment for relapse disease. So that's... Uh, Excellent. We have another question from Twitter. Uh, Dexter M. Neal asks, what kind of studies have you seen that relate to secondary cancers for young adult lymphoma survivors? Go ahead, Dr. Kelly. I guess just to, you know, make sure I understand the question, but it, um, you know, after treatment for cancer, I, I, patients can be at risk for developing second cancers, um, or they can be at risk for developing a recurrence. Um, if it's I guess if the question is in regards to a second cancer from treatment, um, most of those are related to the radiation therapy that has been administered, uh, particularly in the setting of Hodgkin lymphoma, where a combination of chemotherapy and radiation is um, oftentimes recommended. Many of these uh, radiation-related cancers, though, can take a very long time to develop, um, oftentimes you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. So the most important thing is to have ongoing follow-up with, with a physician that it, or other provider that is experienced in the management of patients that have received treatment for lymphoma. Um, all too often we see that after completing therapy, particularly for young adults, uh, they tend to drift away and not have that continued follow-up and many times are unaware that they're at risk for developing these long-term uh, long, you know, complications. So we do strongly recommend that they identify a provider, whether it's a primary care physician who is comfortable in the management of long-term side effects of treatment, or they follow up with a specialized long-term follow-up center. You know, in many cities, these type of services are available. Or they continue to follow up with their oncologist and make sure that screening is done for some of these long-term secondary cancers. 
Excellent. Um, Dr. Evans, Dr. Kelly mentioned Hodgkin lymphoma. What's the difference between Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma? Sure. I think there's a lot of similarities. They're both those cancer of the immune, si uh, of immune system. But there, I would say, are a couple differences. One is the exact cell of origin. Generally speaking, Hodgkin's is always from a B cell, which we actually didn't know before. For almost 175 years, we actually called it Hodgkin's disease because we didn't know where it came from. And it's interesting, some of the treatment success for Hodgkin's preceded the science, where we, from some of the really seminal work in the 1960s and 70s, that combining chemotherapy drugs together, we found that it increased the cure rate from using single drugs at a time. But then we eventually started to figure out some of the biology, not just what's on the surface, what's inside the cell, and now even for Hodgkin's, we have targeted cells. I think also there are some clinical differences. We see what patients we see them in. Um, you know, great to have a pediatric oncologist here, and pediatric oncology goes up to 30. 21. <laughs> uh, but doesn't it, you, you, do you treat any higher? Uh, we sometimes treat people in their 20s. <laughs> so there's a little bit. We'll treat usually down as adult oncologists down to 18. So there's a little bit of crossover. Part of the reason um, perseverating on that is that's the age we see Hodgkin's, is right in the 20s is the most common. Then it kind of becomes less common, and then it becomes more common in your 70s and 80s. Whereas non-Hodgkin's is not impossible, but pretty uncommon uh, as a, at a younger age and rises more exponentially as age goes on in terms of its incidence. And then lastly, I would just say a slight difference is usually Hodgkin's is mainly in the lymph nodes, whereas non-Hodgkin's, it can start to spread to a few unusual sites, like it can spread to the bone, even the brain, and things like that, where it's a little less common, or I'd say, actually I'd say a lot less common for Hodgkin's. But generally speaking, we treat them actually the same with some form of chemotherapy, and hopefully now in the air, as Dr. Sotomayor said, of targeted therapeutics, targeting the cancer cell itself. So what's the difference between indolent and aggressive lymphoma? Sure, and that's, when we think of that, that's more non-Hodgkin's, uh, number one. And number two, it's really more B-cell non-Hodgkin's because most of the T-cell Hodgkin's, I'd say of about 15 of them, 13 are aggressive. There's only a couple indolent. But generally speaking, indolent means slow growing. Yeah. And so I guess that's a good thing about it. And the most common indolent lymphoma is called follicular lymphoma. It's the most common in the United States. And so sometimes patients, it'll be diagnosed incidentally. They'll be shaving, feel lymph node, or have an appendectomy, but feel fine. And sometimes some indolent lymphoma patients, they feel good. We don't have to rush to a treatment. We, we do what's called watchful waiting. They might go five, 10 years before they need a treatment. Now, it usually does start to grow, and then we need to give a treatment, and thankfully, it's very treatable, 90% go in remission, but then it usually comes back. So it's a little more chronic, not necessarily curable. Whereas aggressive, you could never wait months and certainly not years. It's ones that are more aggressive. They grow within days and weeks. So that's a bad side. The upside of aggressives is, generally speaking, the goal is not just to treat it, to put in remission. The goal is cure. In other words, go away, never come back. So I wouldn't say one is good or bad. They're just different kind of natural history and characteristics. Do we ever see a form of lymphoma switch from one to the other? It does. You, you got all, you, you got good <laughs> questions. You got all yeah. good information. It absolutely does. And that's a, it, it interestingly, it, if it changes, it usually is from indolent over to aggressive. And there is an entity called transformed lymphoma. It's literally transforming over and follicular lymphoma, actually one to 2% of patients per year, it will transform. And then you kind of have to treat it once it's transformed like you would a typical aggressive lymphoma. Still treatable and then even potentially curable of that aggressive lymphoma. Excellent, I want to do one more reset here for everybody who's watching on social media, whether it's YouTube Live or Facebook Live. Welcome to our 2017 Ed Chat here with the Lymphoma Research Foundation. We're answering your questions about lymphoma research, clinical trials, and resources out there. So please, if you have a question, make sure you send it our way and we'll get our esteemed panel of doctors here to uh, answer it if we can. Uh, moving on, Dr. Sotomayor, let's talk about immunotherapy. How is it used to treat lymphomas? 
And uh, are there specific subtypes that the treatment is currently being used for? So when we t talk about immunotherapy, so let me just give you a little bit of a uh, historic background. So the first type of immunotherapy that was used in lymphoma was uh, with uh, monoclonal antibodies. So. Uh, I'm sorry. It was monoclonal antibodies, so okay. one of, I mean, there are several now of those, but basically, so, so there is, uh, so we have the malignant B cells and there are proteins uh, in the surface, on the surface of the cells. And then, uh, so several investigators dis decided to, to create antibodies that are going to bind to one of these targets on the surface, uh, and that is going to produce uh, a, a, a series of immunological activation that is going to result in killing of the, the tumor cells. So the first uh, monoclonal antibody approved for the treatment of human cancer was for the treatment of follicular lymphoma. The monoclonal antibody is called rituximab. And uh, when we have that monoclonal antibody, so we saw that when used as a single treatment produced some responses, but the responses were not sustained. So then the idea was, okay, what about if we combine this new immunotherapy with chemotherapy? And that was the beginning of the era of chemo immunotherapy. So that's uh, our CHOP, rituximal CHOP. Then we use rituximal in combination with other uh, chemotherapy drugs for a variety of B-cell malignancies, uh, for follicular lymphoma, large cell lymphoma, mantis cell lymphoma, you name it. So we use that, that combination. So then we start to develop more antibodies against other targets. Against, uh, other proteins, and also now there are monoclonal antibodies for T cell lymphomas. So one of them is, uh, uh, Dr. Evans referred, there is an um, antibody against CD30 that is expressed on some subsets of T cell lymphomas. So we were quite successful using antibodies, but then, so there is another arm of the immune system that we call the, the cellular arm of the immune system in which we have the T lymphocytes. Uh, for many years, we knew, and especially in Hodgkin's lymphoma, so when, when in, in Hodgkin's lymphoma is very uh, interesting. Uh, in the tumor mass, only 1% to 2% of the tumor mass are malignant cells. 98% are going to be normal immune cells, stromal cells that are going to be creating that perfect environment for Hodgkin's malignant cells to survive. So which means that you have the tumor cells, but also you have all your T cells surrounding or some T cells surrounding. They're supposed to be attacking the cancer cell, but they, they're protecting it. They are, they are protecting them. But also, you know, the tumor cells, so now we know that tumor cells is also smart. So they develop mechanisms. And they express a protein that is called PDL1. And when this protein is expressed, so the T cells express the ligand, or it's called PD1. And when that kiss occurs, so then the T cells they're going to live in peace. So basically they are saying, okay, so we are friends, T cell, I'm not going to attack you. Well, someone figured out and asked the question, so what about if we disrupt that love between the tumor cells and the T cells? And that's what is called the anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 antibody. So you disrupt that, and then the T cell will say, oh, you are my enemy, I need to attack you. And that's the success that we have seen now these days with uh, what we call checkpoint locate using anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1. So Dr. Evans mentioned the success in solid tumors. So we are using that treatment for, it's approved now for treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma, has activity in B-cell lymphoma, also has some activity against T-cell lymphoma. Someone asked earlier today about using CAR T-cell for T-cell lymphoma, so that's the future. But right now there are clinical trials using this anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1 antibodies for the treatment of patients with relapsed refractory T-cell lymphoma. So what are the main differences then between the CAR T-cell therapies, as someone asked earlier, and uh, that form of immunotherapy treatment? Okay, so the difference is that when you use the anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1, you are going to create the army of T-cells or wake up the army of T-cells inside the patient's body. So you infuse this treatment, and basically your T-cells that were uh, taking a nap, they were sleepy, they are going to wake up and they say, okay, let's attack the tumor. In the time of CAR T-cells, no, you are going to take those sleepy T-cells from the body, from the patient's body, take them to the lab, do some magic that we call, introduce some proteins and DNA, and then they are going to be better equipped. And then you take those T-cells from the lab and you're going to reinfuse those T-cells back to the patient that so you're taking from. In essence, is what the cancerous cells are doing in there to make them coexist peacefully, is that a, just a different type of protein they're adding than what you're adding in the lab that would make them attack 
the cancerous cells? Right, so what we are doing, so basically, so there are several, I mean, PD-1, PD-1 is just one of those. I mean, there are okay. many. So that these uh, cancer cells are very smart and they take advantage of that. And actually what they are doing is just, you know, this interaction, PD-1, PD-1, happen, happens normally because, uh, so if, if we don't have those mechanisms, the T cells can produce what is called autoimmunity. So the T cell will start to destroy the patient's own tissue. So that's the reason why we have this PD-1, PD-1 mechanism. What cancer cells are doing is they are adapting that to try to, to tell the T cells to not attack me. Right. Dr. Kelly, Dr. Evans, you both look like you want to weigh in here. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it just, <laughs> lymphoma is a love story yes. and, a, and a tragedy. But no, it's a great explanation. It's, it's fascinating, all of this, and it's just incredible science and biology that's ongoing, and it's just exciting to be part of it and to, to do it. Now, with that said, we have a lot to learn, right. and maybe by these incredible mechanisms that Dr. Sotomayor described of one that's waking up existing cells in the body, the pd one inhibitors or PD-1 inhibitors, versus taking out and reinfusing it, well, maybe we should do it together and even combine something else. And, and so we're looking at that. And we also would like to know what's called a part of the clinical trials is not just seeing does this drug work is what's called biomarkers. In other words, we'd like to know when we, or before we give it, who does it work in? Because unfortunately, nothing's 100%, but we'd like to get a little more knowledge instead of just treating, let's say 50% it's gonna work in, not have to treat 100 patients. Maybe find those 50 ahead of time and know who are the 50 before you use it, it's gonna work in. So there's a lot of research going on there on the predictive biomarker side of the aisle. Excellent. So we have a question. Do you, go ahead, Dr. Well, I was just going to add on. Yeah. I think the other importance is that we have to really monitor the side effects of these, you know, particularly these immune therapies. You know, they're, the side effects are very different than more conventional chemotherapy. Um, for myself, as a pediatric oncologist, you know, I worry about what's going to happen in the long term. You know, if we cause autoimmunity, are we going to have patients developing lifelong diabetes or, you know, hypothyroidism or problems with their, you know, uh, inflammation of their gut, like a Crohn's type of picture. So, so I think it's very exciting, but we have to be cautious and we need to study more so that we know, you know, appropriately which patient should get them and how they should be used so that we don't cause any long-term harm. And I think that segues perfectly into this question from Facebook. Chris asks, how far out are we from a world where most treatments are targeted and non-chemotherapy? <laughs> what was the question? How exactly? You know, well, the, that's Can the you give us the day and yeah. time? Yeah. <laughs> Next week? No. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. And, but I, you know, it's one that partly because of the heterogeneity that we talked about earlier, I don't, there's not going to be one silver bullet. It's going to be kind of a lot of bullets, so to speak, that we learn how to combine together. But that, that's exactly right because even I'll give you an example. We've talked a little bit about Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm -hmm. We know with chemotherapy plus minus radiation, we probably cure 90% or more. So some would say, great, you don't need to study that anymore. But a lot of us are saying, no, that's the perfect patient population in a way to say, let's start decreasing our reliance on chemotherapy and can we have that same cure, maybe even higher, but not chemotherapy or radiation, targeted therapy that hopefully is as effective and less toxic. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of years on the end where we're kind of making segmental progress, but it's, it's very hopeful. So what is it that makes that patient population the perfect population to study and continue that research? Well, I would just say since it's already so curable, I wouldn't say it's, I don't want to contrast and compare too much, but it's, we've already kind of, I would say, maxed out in terms of chemotherapy, and we've studied a more aggressive chemo, bone marrow transplants. I think we're, we're pretty well agreed upon that there's no more pushing the envelope in Hodgkin's with chemotherapy radiation, mm -hmm. that if we are gonna make more progress, in particular, avoiding, which I hope we'll talk about, late effects, set, or we've talked a little bit about second cancers, because again, patients are in their 20s, and if 90% are cured, there are side effects that can happen, unfortunately, not uncommonly 20, 30 years down the road. So when they're in their 40s and 50s, getting a breast cancer, getting a heart, having a heart attack, et cetera. So maybe if we have now a combination of targeted drugs, they'll be cured and not have those late effects. So I just, it's a, I would say a population that, or patient population group that we definitely want to study. And Dr. Kelly, being that you are studying um, 
in pediatrics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. You know, we know from studying uh, survivors, patients that were treated in the 1980s and 90s, that when you, you know, go out, we're now 30, 40 <coughs> years out for these patients, that they're, uh, that they're dying from complications of the treatment at the same rate as patients were dying from the Hodgkin lymphoma itself. So clearly, although our therapies, you know, were good at putting patients into remission and curing their Hodgkin, they were leaving them with really long-term problems, deaths, you know, from heart disease, from second cancers, from lung disease. And they also have a lot of chronic health conditions. You know, we know that, um, that these young people are, you know, dealing with, um, you know, significant health effects that cause increased rates of need for disability insurance, reduced quality of life. So, so we need to make changes. And we have been modifying our, our therapies, but, you know, we suspect that we're still going to have survivors that are affected and having to live with complications of the treatment. So we really do need to study these new therapies that will hopefully not have the same side effect profile. But unfortunately, the follow-up is so long. You know, this latency period is decades. So, you know, we'll probably all be retired by the time, <laughs> you know, the current treatments are um, evaluated, you know, for their long-term toxicity profile. So when you look at that and, and you speak to a patient or a parent in, in any case, how do you wrestle with them dealing with the symptoms long term from some of these clinical trials rather than the symptoms they are aware of and know currently exist. Right. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's challenging. I think, you know, we have, um, we have made a lot of changes and, and we, um, the other important area is what we call as surrogate endpoints or intermediate endpoints so that we can look at other markers that may, for example, there's a lot of work looking at markers of heart disease that may allow us to, you know, whether it's changes on, early changes on echocardiograms or different blood tests or um, other ways of being able to predict who's at risk for developing these complications. So we try to use as much information as we can to best estimate the risk of developing these long-term complications, but there still are a lot of unanswered questions there. So, yeah, so yeah, let me add, so regarding this question, I think there are different scenarios here. So one will be, uh, so chemotherapy for some subtype of lymphoma chemotherapy will remain the backbone. So what we are doing is trying to, instead of giving six cycles of treatment, perhaps we can go, we can give less chemotherapy, four cycles of treatment. I mean, Hodgkin's lymphoma, there are some examples of you can use less treatment, less chemotherapy treatment, and perhaps have the same same results. So that's, or the other, the other scenario is the yeah, chemotherapy works, let's try to make it better, let's add this target therapy, this monoclonal antibodies, this checkpoint blockade. But then are definitely there are subtypes of lymphoma in which we know the chemotherapy doesn't work. T-cell lymphoma. So I think in those areas, T-cell lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, it is going to be feasible perhaps to move faster into using combination of target therapy. So I can give you an example. I use I treat mantle cell lymphoma for many years. We rely heavily in uh, combination chemotherapy, and now there is an interesting uh, study showing that if you combine one monoclonal antibody with one immunomodulatory agent, lenalidomide, you can have probably good results uh, as comparable to using conventional chemotherapy. So I think there are going to be subtypes in which it's going to be easy to integrate this novel target therapy based on what we know about what is wrong with the tumor cells. Uh, but also a word of caution, so uh, I tell the patients, oh, so now I can take my oral, oral medication. If, if, if I combine two different oral agents, it should be easier. This is going to be easier mm. than chemotherapy. Well, not too easy. I mean, there were clinical trials in which we said, okay, let's combine this target therapy. It's a pill plus another pill. It's going to be easy. Well, some of the patients have significant side effects. So we need to be careful, although, you know, Patients need to link oral therapy is going to be better than the bad chemotherapy mm -hmm. that uh, patients used to receive in the past, so we need to be careful. That being said, how mm -hmm. important are those patients who are willing to go and, and try these new therapies for a cure in, in pushing the advancement of the treatment? So, you know, in the, in the field of mantle cell lymphomas, we say every patient should try to look for a clinical trial from day one. And probably the same is true for some of the T cell lymphomas in which, so we know the chemotherapy. And we have tried several combinations, multiple drugs, and the results, I mean, we, we, were, una we, we were unable to cure patients with some subtype of t cell So there are some subtypes where we know current treatments don't work, exactly. so you're better off being in a clinical trial the, and, and hoping. With a new, yeah, especially what we knew now, I mean, uh, and all the new, new therapies that are available.
Excellent. We have another question here uh, from Facebook. Victor asks, if someone is on active surveillance, what symptoms should they be watching for in CLL? Sure, yeah, it's the hope is if they're in active surveillance, they either it's low volume or they're in remission. And generally speaking, they're, they're not specific. Uh, it often reflects lowering of blood counts like anemia or low platelets called thrombocytopenia. So if you're anemic, it's usually fatigue that is seen. Sometimes there's bleeding with thrombocytopenia. Sometimes infections, there's an increased risk. But, as, but if a patient is in a pretty good follow-up mode with their oncologist, if anything, I, I would say more often than not, we see the blood test changing often before a patient feels it. But with that said, we still want a patient, of course, active in their care and to let us know if there's anything unusual. I would say uncommonly those B symptoms that, was, that I had mentioned in terms of fevers, sweats, and weight loss, if that was to happen. Usually the general advice will say if there's any unusual symptom that lasts more than days, especially a few weeks, to let us know. Right. When you talk about the blood changing before they see the symptoms, is that one of those biomarkers that we were talking a little bit out about earlier, or is that different? The, uh, different, but it, the, these are just kind of like normal blood tests, what's called a complete blood count. The biomarkers refer a little bit more towards once you start a therapy to identify who it works and who it doesn't work in. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question from YouTube. Adam asks, when a PET scan is not definitive and a biopsy is inconclusive, what is the next step to confirm remission or not? So if you've done a PET scan and a biopsy. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, go yeah. Yeah, So I think that, uh, so the PET scan, so, it, so, you, so what is this scenario? So the patient was diagnosed, received treatment. Uh, so the PET scan uh, before treatment was like a Christmas tree. There was a lot of you know, brightness. And then at the end of treatment, there is one area and so we look at the PET scan, we say, well, is this active disease or not? And then we have that dabs. Uh, so one thing that we do is we say, okay, let's wait two or three months and see what happened with that only area that is positive on the PET scan. Or sometimes we say, so let's go for a biopsy. Uh, I, so if we do a PET scan and we are not convinced that the patient is in remission and the biopsy is negative, what I will do is just probably wait and repeat that imaging test uh, later on. However, I tell the patient, look, if something changes if you start to develop the symptoms that Dr. Evans was referring, so just call me right away because that will be an indication that disease is coming back. Dr. Kelly? Yeah, I just would add that, you know, PET scans, unfortunately, they're a great addition and they help us, but there still are a lot of false positives mm -hmm. with the tests, and especially with the use of immunotherapies. Uh, we're seeing that there can sometimes be an increased um, uptake. It can be brighter, and, but it's not a sign that the disease isn't responding. It's just that that's kind of a, the immune cells are getting in there and they're also causing the PET scan to light up. So, you know, as Dr. Sotomayor said, you have to, you know, be cautious and not, you know, overinterpret the PET scan and just follow up because um, it's not a perfect test by any means. But I, I would agree, and I would also say that it's reassuring if the biopsy was negative. It's not definitive, but usually is reassuring, mm -hmm. and the patient can be followed. A whole other area of research interest, we've talked a lot about drugs, but there are, is a lot of research on the diagnostics side of the aisle, so there's something called a liquid biopsy. Not ready for prime time yet, but some really, really cool, interesting research. In other words, could we be at a point in our lifetime, I hope so, where you don't have to do a biopsy or you have to do less biopsies because we know these tumors secrete little forms of tumor cells into the blood. And at least what we have in the clinic now, we don't have the test to detect that, but in the research labs, they're able to detect these really, not only detect these really rare cells, but see really specific characteristics of these rare cells. So could we literally have a blood test and almost mimic what we would see on a biopsy? That is really exciting research to, to really help patients and to guide therapy, uh, reassuring to situations like this. So all of you mentioned the um, lack of reliability of the PET scan, the false positives that exist. Is a biopsy always done in uh, conjunction with a PET scan? No. 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 no, and that's where it's just good old-fashioned clinical judgment. Yeah. And a PET scan is what we would say, um, it, it, like Dr. Sotomayor said, a Christmas tree, it kind of lights up, but it's black and white. It's an intensity, but there is a big gray zone yes. there. And so you, you need clinical judgment because it'll get into that gray zone where it could be real or it could not be real. 
And so as the clinician, you have to decide based on experience and the patient other symptoms and findings, do I do a biopsy or do I watch and wait, so to speak, close observation? I would say more often than not, that little gray zone turns away negative. So then how important is it for patients to learn about their disease so that they have some of this information and, and can process it as it comes in? Critical. And I think we always recommend patients to be informed. And so they're, we're lucky to have organizations such as Lymphoma Research Foundation. And that's every patient I see, especially newly diagnosed, I'll write three letters, LRF, down. And, and, and in reality, because it's, there's a lot of funny sites out there and anecdotes. It's, it's all the facts. It's about diseases. I mean, it's amazing patient education. There's obviously clinical trials hotline. They can link you with another patient who's had shared experience and really a great resource. But also, as mentioned, clinicaltrials.gov. So that's also a good site. The, the government actually is some good information. Thank you. Dr. Kelly, do you want to add something there? No, I just oh. would you know, echo that. And I think, um, I think one of the things we learned over this weekend is that, particularly in the area of survivorship and care after completing treatment, uh, that there still is uh, a need for more awareness, you know, people to understand the risks and what kind of testing needs to be done. So, you know, reaching out, becoming educated, getting information like organi organizations like LRF is really critical. Beautiful. We have another question here from Facebook. Sophia asks, for which lymphoma subtypes should patients have diagnostic tests for biomarkers to help inform their treatment? Dr. Sotomayor. <laughs> <laughs> It's tough work, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I would say that uh, maybe, uh, maybe, well, not, not for. The few sorts of B cell, maybe double hits double and all hit, that. Yeah. Right, right, right. What right. double hits, what, is, what yeah. does that mean? A double hit, so it's not maybe a biomarker. I guess you could call it a biomarker. So uh, I'll tell patients, just like uh, police do DNA testing at a crime scene. So this is DNA testing on the tumor cells, DNA and RNA testing. It's abnormal DNA and RNA, but now we know there are certain patterns of the lymphoma's DNA, so to speak, that have rearranged. And if you have a certain pattern, double hit is two and sometimes it can be three specific changes of, of chromosomes. And if you have that, we know that conventional therapy is not good enough and you have to use something else. So that's what we mean by a biomarker. It really predicts you need a different treatment or you need this treatment. So that's just scratching the surface. There's a whole host of other really good biomarker studies that are being done. Anything else you want to add, Dr.? So perhaps also, you know, in the, in the field of, uh, you know, T-cell lymphoma, there is an uh, uh, antibody against CD30, and there is, these antibodies are approved for some subtype of T-cell lymphomas. Uh, and then there are some clinical trials ongoing uh, in which, so there is a different degree of expression of this targeting, other type of T-cell lymphomas. And, so in order for these patients to be enrolled, so we, we ask, is the tumor expressing this specific marker? So therefore, the patient will be enrolled in a clinical trial using this specific treatment for that. So, so that will be one example. And then, so another situation that I have, uh, but this is um, off, and it, it was not part of a, a clinical trial, is a patient with a, a relaxed refractory uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma that I was running out of options. And so and then I asked my pathologist, I mean, can you check for CD30? Because there is a treatment for CD30. And actually that patient, specific patient, has an expression of that. So then, uh, so that will be a good rationale to use a treatment that is already available. But then you need to do some, you need to, to do some extra work to be able to use that treatment that is not approved for this subtype of T cell lymphoma. But that will be perhaps one example of, of in, in a situation in which just doing this extra test can help you in making treatment decisions. Excellent. Uh, another question from Facebook. Michael yeah. asks, what are some challenges doctors consider when developing a treatment plan for a young lymphoma patient? So for the young patients, you know, we're very mindful not just of curing the lymphoma, but the long-term side effects. You know, so somebody with Hodgkin lymphoma is, you know, 70, you may think less about using radiation treatment or, you know, using higher cumulative doses of certain medications like doxorubicin, which can affect the heart function. So with young patients, we're thinking very much about, you know, these long-term complications. We're also thinking about fertility because uh, fertility is going to be much more important to somebody in their 
you know, 20s than it is going to be in somebody in their 40s or 50s. So that we, you know, recommend regimens that are going to minimize the risks um, to try to make sure that we can preserve, you know, all of these issues that are equally as important as curing the lymphoma. Okay. Dr. The great news, too, is we, uh, as Dr. Kelly alluded to, have really learned a lot in the last 10 to 20 years about late effects. And thankfully, there are experts exactly in this. And in other words, they are survivorship experts. And there are clinics uh, more attuned to the AYA population. But you know what? It, you still are a survivor in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. And there is more and more data being developed to say, you as a cancer survivor, fantastic, you're cured of that cancer. Now let's keep an eye on you and things to make sure maybe you need a little closer heart uh, monitoring of your heart or your lungs, et cetera. So it, it's actually becoming a mandate across the country to, almost, uh, to have a majority of patients have a survivorship plan. And there literally is a plan that you can have as a, can a cancer survivor that says for you, what you were treated, your age, et cetera, here's a recommended test and follow-up, and you can actually bring that to your primary care provider, and you can work together with them. Excellent. Yeah, we, you know, we, one of our speakers yesterday shared an example from her practice of a, you know, a woman who was in her 50s who had been treated about 20, 30 years before that for Hodgkin lymphoma, had received radiation, and had no idea that the breast cancer that she developed, that the skin cancer she developed was a complication of her treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma. So when she finally got to the survivorship clinic, it was like an epiphany, you know, and it finally all made sense. So there's such a need for people to recognize and follow up and, and really, you know, continue to be, have their care led by experts in this disease. Excellent. We have uh, another question from Twitter here. Chris asks, are there any must-have resources or tools you see as the most helpful for patients or their loved ones? Send it to the floor. <laughs> So sure. I think, you know, uh, 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 what I tell my patients is, uh, especially, you know, mantis cell lymphoma, uh, remember, uh, if you go to a website, it's still from, from 10 years ago, it says, oh, it's a bad disease, you're going to die tomorrow. And I, I tell my patient, look, you need to look for good resources, the Lymphoma Research Foundation, National Cancer Institute, is extremely helpful for patients. Yeah, and just those resources are good, but just good old-fashioned conversation with your oncologist. Should never be afraid or not want to have that conversation. If there's any questions, whether about prognosis or other treatment options, should completely be open to have that conversation. And hopefully there is an open conversation. If not, as Dr. Sotomayor said, there are a lot of resources and other avenues to pursue. And I just add, uh, especially for the younger patients, there's survivorshipguidelines.org, which lists a lot of information about the long-term complications of treatment. Excellent. Doctors, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. We're just about out of time here. Uh, this is part of the annual North American Educational Forum on Lymphoma, our Ed Forum chat, as we like to call it, 2017. For more information, you can call the helpline at 1-800-500-9976. One more time for you. That's 1-800-500-9976. It's open Monday through Friday from 9.30 till 7.30. And next year's Ed Forum will be at Manhattan Beach in California. Uh, that's October 12th to the 14th. And of course, plenty of more information for you on lymphoma.org. Thank you so much for participating. And please reach out if you have any more questions you'd like answered. Thank you, everyone.